Hi, I'm Jan Paul Siebert from Glasgow University, and the title just trips off the, the tongue, uh, but it's all about uh, data efficiency in um, using DCNNs for image analysis. And uh, I realize I'm between you and the, the coffee break, so I'll stay within time. Okay, so, so, what, so I, I run the um, Computer Vision for Autonomous Systems group at uh, Computing Science at Glasgow University. And we're into robotic systems and vision systems, uh, cheap vision systems for robotics. So what we'd really like to be able to do is have our um, vision systems operate on low power, low cost platforms. These things, the ubiquitously available um, uh, smartphone or that, that sort of platform, perhaps using the components from it. The cameras, for example, in these are, are um, very high resolution and um, fabulously expensive. I think we priced at 12 pounds for a high resolution camera module. So in, in robotics, we would love to be able to um, run our uh, deep nets on these sorts of platforms and have cheap interfaces, as I say, um, uh, low bandwidth interfaces. We would like to uh, be able to use the smartphone in egocentric perception applications where you could just hang the phone around your neck and use it, in, for example, monitoring activity or um, in, in certain other activities where it's doing um, recording of, of, of what you're doing, what's going on around about you. But the, the real snag in, in using it is that at the moment, state-of-the-art nets can only process a patch of about 300 by 300 pixels in size. That patch has to be run over the image. In fact, you build a, 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 an image a pyramid, run the patch over the pyramid, and uh, that takes time. So the forward path might only be you know, a, a couple of milliseconds to run the model, but you've got to do it in many, many locations. So this really limits what you can do. So it would be nice if we didn't have to do that. And the, the hypothesis which I proposed um, here last year is that we can use a transformation that occurs between the retina and the primary visual cortex. So what our objective has been over the past year is to develop a, a proof of concept that we can take what's known as the retinocortical transform, the transformation between our retinas and the primary visual cortex, and that, in effect, squeezes down the data by up to about two orders of magnitude, uh, potentially. So we haven't seen anybody else try this for a long time. There were attempts to do something similar back in the 80s. For those of short attention span, I'll just give you the results right now. So using a 4,000 node retina, we've got about a, seven, uh, about a factor of seven decrease in, for our pilot study, about a factor of seven decrease in the visual data going from the input to the retina to the output to the, the deep net. We have just implemented a 50,000 node high resolution retina, and that gives about um, a factor of 17 reduction. For the 4K node retina, we suffered about five-ish percent reduction with this very, very first pilot run. We, we haven't been able to realize the full reduction in terms of the net because we have to produce an image, um, a cortical image, rather than operate on the retina responses directly, but I'll explain what that's about. Um, but we do experience a reduction in training as well, which we predicted. So let, let, let's go into what this is all about. So the approach, here we have <coughs> uh, a sort of sampling pattern of a retina. It's, it's long been known that our vision is foveated, so if you stick your thumb out, what you see at arm's length in central field of view, about plus or minus two and a half degrees of uh, visual angle, is all that you see in full resolution. The rest gracefully fades out, in fact, exponential reduction in sampling density. Now, this is nature's way of controlling the, the amount of information going into the brain. And, and we have followed the strategy. It, it allows us to squeeze down the amount of visual information. So we have a, a pseudo-hexagonal uh, tessellation there. This is a, a tessellation was developed by, originally by uh, Clippingdale and Wilson at um, Warwick University a, a long time ago in the 80s. And the, the idea is very simple. If we can couple this um, tessellation to a deep net, 
then we can get, gain not only the reduction in uh, data, but also if we apply the same sort of transformation that happens between the retina and the brain, we get a, a degree of rotation and scale invariance as well. And as is often cited in the uh, biomimetic literature, if nature hadn't involved this strategy in primates, our brains would weigh about 60 kilos, kind of like this guy here. So an overview of the pipeline that we implemented to um, test the concept. We have an input image, pardon the use of Lena, that was my MSU student. Um, we have, for each of the sampling points, we have a Gaussian uh, receptive field, essentially just a Gaussian weighted um, averaging of the input sample, so a Gaussian convolution that generates one response, high resolution in the center of the foveal region going out to lower uh, resolution at the periphery. This is what the cortical space looks like, and you notice it's split up the middle. Now, something that un unless you um, uh, work in physiology, you're probably not aware of, is that the, your vision is split up the vertical meridian of each eye. So in each eye, the right half of the, the visual field goes to the left half of the brain, and the, the left half, sorry, of the retina, and the left half of the retina goes to the right half of the brain. And there's an overlap of about one or two degrees of visual angle. It turns out that this sort of falls out of the, the mathematics of the, the mapping. Um, interestingly, here we see it projected into an image. We wanted just to be able to use the standard machinery available for deep nets, so we, we haven't yet attempted to use the direct um, retinal sampled responses, which would be much more efficient. So we, we instead have rendered out an image, and then we apply a standard um, deep net to that image. This is our, our deep net classifier, which uh, was developed uh, for the pilot study. Now, vision isn't a passive um, uh, activity. Vision requires active inter interaction with the environment. So unless... Uh, um, that something's very badly wrong. We don't tend to sit and stare um, into space. We direct our eyes because our eyes are being driven to complete some task. The only point of having vision is to be able to do something with it. So we have a gaze control system that directs the fovea, the high resolution part, to um, appropriate locations in the image. So overall rationale, the retina can substantially reduce the data space going into the net. The mapping affords a degree of scale and rotation invariance, and the fovea itself, the foveation, acts as an attentional spotlight. And one of the surprising things about this is that it has the potential to actually improve the performance of the system. This original retina we developed ooh, 10, 12 years ago, quite, quite a time ago, and we use SIFT features at the back end of it. And one of the surprising things is that when we compared the performance of full resolution SIFT in the same image compared to the retina uh, with the SIFT-like features we extracted out of the back of it, we actually got an uh, a performance improvement using the retina. And this might seem counterintuitive, but the reason is that supposing you're, you're looking at somebody's face, you don't recognize the face from the skin pores the, 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 the highest resolution information, you might want to use that information to verify some aspect of the face, but you recognize the face from the gross structural architecture and features. So wiping away that extraneous information, setting um, the information in context, reduces the combinatorial explosion of feature relations, but also cuts down the amount of, just simply the amount of noise and extraneous clutter. So how do we do it? Retinal sampling, put down the sample points, the Gaussian receptor fields go down, and we create an image vector of the, of the responses at each location. We can forward project them uh, with smaller Gaussians to interpolate into an image in the cortical space. This is the 50,000 node retina. And this is the back projected uh, image back into retinal space, having gone through the image vector to give a visualization of what the retina sees. And for the 50,000 node retina, you can see that the, the reduction in resolution from the, the fovea to the periphery isn't all that large. However, this image was 930 by 930 pixels, so that's about 800,000 pixels, where this is 50,000 samples. So already that's the potential in terms of data reduction. 
Now, the other slightly obvious thing, one of the questions we asked was, would this thing be able to learn because we have a very, very distorted um, output space? On the other hand, that's what's going on inside the back of your head as you look at this right now. So, as I said, inspired by the, the primate um, and uh, human uh, visual pathway, we process each half separately, but combine it in a single image for this purpose, rather than having two um, cortical hemifields. The, the mapping preserves local information, and uh, we have projected it using Gaussian, uh, little Gaussian kernels to, to generate a, an image that we can operate on using standard DCNNs. So it's similar to the old log polar mapping, the, the actual log part actually takes place as part of the, the retinal sampling. It's a conformal um, uh, angle-preserving mapping, so the Cauchy-Riemann uh, condition holds. It gives partial scale and rotation invariance, if, if you can imagine that concept. And the cortical magnification, which is also seen in exactly the same in the brain, uh, gives a, a very, very high resolution um, uh, central field of view, progressively lower resolution uh, peripheral field of view. So it's a bit like nature's zoom lens. We have about overall almost 180 degrees of visual field if you move your fingers out and, uh, until you stop seeing them anymore. However, we, can, we have excellent um, central uh, resolution set in the context of that entire field of view. The other interesting property is that for any size of contour, when we're fixating at the center of the contours, we have round about the same number of units of neural processing sampling the contour, so it does an automatic load balancing. So it puts the processing where it's required. Now, what I've shown here is the, when we project from the retina into the cortical space, we take each half of the... Um, the visual field separately, and there's an alpha overlap parameter that sets in the polar mapping how much um, overlap we get between the two halves. And setting it from zero to 30 pixels as we see going round in a clockwise direction, that's uh, zero, uh, five, 15, and 30 pixels of overlap, produces quite a markedly different um, mapping. We chose this mapping as a good compromise between the density of the um, samples being clustered together uh, as against having too much overlap. The higher the density, then the less interpolation we need to do, therefore the more data reduction we get. But ideally, we wouldn't produce an image, a, a cortical image at all. We'd operate directly on these samples. We have done quite a lot of optimization to trade off between the, the sharpness of the, uh, uh, the cortical image versus aliasing. So for the 4,000 node uh, input image, it was about 168 by 168 input pixels. As of only last week, we were up to the 930 by 930 um, input 50K node retina. So these results are, are, are hot off the press. So we've done the validation on, or the initial validation on the small retina, but not yet on the large retina. How to decide where the retina looks? Well, the requirements was to explore salient areas of the image. I was at a, a workshop in saliency last year, and we spent half of the workshop arguing about what saliency is. In this case, we take it to be um, the dictionary definition of that, that which is conspicuous or important. Um, in other words, corners. And we also want the, the, the gaze control algorithm to uh, prevent the system repeatedly just going back to where it had been looking. So as anybody who's read Yarbus's book on eye movements, gaze control is highly dependent, highly task dependent. So whether you're looking at a room of faces like this or being asked to find somebody, your, your gaze um, uh, motions will be very, very different. However, for a, a default gaze where you have an object, you want the thing to explore the object, find salient locations, and, and uh, to gather training images, this is the, the type of gaze control algorithm we have. We've got two maps. We have a saliency map and an inhibition of return map, which prevents re return to the same location. So we have uh, each, in each location of the input image where the retina uh, visits, we stick down in, the, in, our, in our inhibition map a Gaussian about 
the size of the fovea. In our CLNC map, we simply find, in this case, we use SIFT. We use SIFT features as uh, salient locations, and we put down the Gaussian envelope uh, into the CLNC map of where the, 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 of the, the SIFTs. Then we subtract the two maps such that the inhibition of return map is subtracted from the CLNC map, and what's left is the peaks according to the salient positions that haven't been visited. So it's very, very simple, but sufficient for initial experiments to drive the retina around to look at um, interesting locations on some object that's going to be uh, learned. So for the validation to show that the, the idea uh, works um, on the 4K node retina, we wanted to, first of all, establish that the thing will learn. There was nothing to say that really with this type of DCNN and this very, very distorted image, it was going to learn anything. So, and, but having done that, we wanted to determine the data reduction improvement, um, whether the, par the partial scale and rotation variance actually does uh, improve the learning rates, and also determine the contribution between the foveated um, retinal sampling and the mapping that does the, the, um, the polar mapping to achieve scale and rotation, uh, partial invariance. So for this little pilot experiment, we had only four classes of object, um, fairly household things like um, brown bear, raccoon, keyboard, and um, basketball mesh, actually. Uh, about 2,500 training images and about um, 1,000 evaluation and test images for each class. And we have four sets. We have un, um, uh, original data over the same field of view as, as the retina. The back projected retinal in information with no um, cortical mapping and then the full retinal cortical mapping itself. The, 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 as I showed before, the, this is our uh, DCNN, pretty standard. I think there's three or four, four um, levels of um, uh, convolution, convolutional layers and uh, then a, a, a bottleneck and softmax at the end. And we're using um, linear rectification. Now, by comparing the different data sets, we can work out which um, the, the contribution from each uh, part of the process. So as I said before, for the 4,000 node retina, we get about, oh, about seven, uh, times seven uh, data, uh, visual data reduction. Our classification precision has gone down by about 5%, but that was a very early version of the retina. And I think with optimization, we can do quite a lot better than that. We went down from about 16 epochs, um, from 25 to 16 epochs on, on the cortical image. So that was quite a substantial improvement. From the, the, the different classifications, so full resolution, it was 87%, uh, 87.5% 87 at full resolution. With just the retina, it goes down to 86 with the retinal sampling, then down to 82 with the full cortical transform. Therefore, the the retinal subsampling seems to be reasonably well parameterized. We're not losing too much on that, but the cortical transform uh, seems to be losing most. The hypothesis is that this is due to the interpolated projection potentially, and that's what we'd like to get rid of in the, in the next generation of this. We have only just had the, the 50 key uh, retina produced. It's produced using a self-similar annealing uh, neural net, so it takes quite a bit of time. Um, originally, when we did this work, for 32,000 node uh, retina, it took about a week of processing. Today, using a GTX 1080, it takes about 14 hours for the 50, 50 key node retina, but you only need to do it once. This, as I said, produced uh, about a factor of 17 uh, visual data reduction if you could just operate on those retinal responses themselves. Uh, and we're achieving about a factor of six almost uh, compression in terms of the reduction of the size of the net. Our goal is to be able to use all of that um, to get right down to be able to, pr to process the, um, the visual data in a single gulp, gulp through the um, deep net at full, at full speed. 
So, as I say, recent work, 50, 50 key node retinas described. We have a, a real-time execution of the 50 key node retina on um, uh, NVIDIA GPU. That was uh, Laurent, Laurent Spalock, my um, <coughs> uh, MSc student. So it, this has been running on a mobile processor on a laptop, but on a 1080 Ti, it runs in about 13 milliseconds. And that's on, three, uh, that's on the RGB channels. Python wrappers, works in most NVIDIA GPUs, and auto detects things like Atomic Add, which can speed up the, the production of cortical images or back projected images. We also have um, Ryan Wong, another MSc student, produced the, the thing running on uh, an Apple iPhone. So we have that looking around, and the innovation there is that we're using the, the um, cortical space, we're applying the SIFT there to do the um, gaze control, which is more efficient because it's a much smaller space, of course. And finally, um, Tom Esper, another uh, MSc student, MSc IT student, who's actually a physiologist, has, has taken the main cell species for color uh, ganglion cells in the retina and also the um, magna, uh, magnocellular pathway, the, the temporal change um, ganglion cells, and implemented these. And we've run the whole lot on the GPU, as I'll show. So here we see, or I would see if I have my glasses on, So th this is the, the input retina. Th this is the thing just being applied to the RGB channels, and this is the output cortical image. And if you look at this, this is going on in your head. Yeah, kind of odd. So we, we see the effect of cortical magnification, and the, the basic idea is that scale changes manifest themselves as shifts along this axis. Rotations manifest themselves as variations up in the opposite axis. And that's, that's real time. This is on the iPhone. So that's the scene that the iPhone stuck down. It's only, uh, he's only implemented it in black and white. So the, the, the feature locations, potential interest locations, are being picked up with a gaze control algorithm, a slightly different gaze control algorithm on the cortical image, which is driving the, the cell phone to sort of sit there and uh, uh, look around. We did this partly as a, as a sort of demonstration of concept and partly it would be nice to be able to use it to do data collection. So because the, the um, iPhone's field of view, uh, image size is very large, we let the, the retina rove about that while updating the image at the same time. Now, <clears throat> here's an example of the... the, the the, the color processing that goes on in the retina, and also it, how it impacts data efficiency. It's striking that people like DeepMind, when they, they try to do hand-eye coordination in robotics using simulation, will simulate the, the robot picking something up and putting it in the bin, but they'll do that for all possible rotations, um, different scales, and different background foreground uh, color changes, which is fantastic to show that you can do it end to end from pixels without applying anything else, but it's absolutely nuts in terms of signal processing. So what the retina does, it has um, uh, differential difference of Gaussians type cells for intensity, and for color it has a um, blue, green, and, uh, sorry, red, green, or blue, yellow whole um, opponent cells, differential center or surround cells in B for uh, red, green, blue, yellow, and it has what's called double opponent cells, where you have the same opponency, a central um, red, green, with a larger surround um, red, green in opposite direction. So that these things are, so A is for detecting difference in color, B is for detecting color contour, and um, essentially the process in D is for detecting color texture. So this is already, these, these color contrasts are, are being detected 
so that we don't need to, um, so that it gives the, the, the gamut of color contrasts without having to go and learn them all. And you, you see a hint of these. So this is intensity, it's a sort of standard difference of Gaussian type map. And here we see the positive and negative responses for the, the blue, uh, green, red, and yellow, blue uh, cells. As a result, you can start to see the, the property of doing it that way is that the contrast between the two produces, starts to produce a segmentation. The other part of the, the data efficiency is that the brain doesn't um, represent negative numbers directly. It has dual channels. So that the outputs of these cells, the positive output is in one channel, and the negative output is made positive and, and down a different channel. And that automatically, by definition, gives the first stages of visual segmentation. So here we have the, the whole lot in one mega display. So what we see up here is the back projected response, the cortical response for color, the back projected response for, for intensity and the cortical image. And this is for change, and these are temporal cells. So these are for the intensity images. The, it's looking at the differences in, in, in uh, rate of change and having a positive and negative channel uh, separated out. Now you switched it back just to the um, basic cells and we see here the um, differential, uh, the dog cells for intensity and the, the color channels up above. So the, the next step is now to harness and, and is, is now messing about with, there's a perception threshold as to when these things kick in. He's now, <clears throat> So, so the next challenge is harnessing all of these within architectures. So work in progress. We would like to validate the 50K node retina to find out what level of performance we can actually get out of that on a big data set in terms of uh, uh, improvement in training and uh, data reduction. We're, we're also very interested in being able to use things like TensorFlow and different input layer architectures, perhaps using Lambda layers, to be able to specify each of the individual retinal positions. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody who can tell me how to do this, along with um, the immediate uh, neighbors, so that we don't need to build this cortical image. We can go directly to the retinal responses and get the full reduction and then validate the entire, the, the color receptor fields uh, along with the, um, the, 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 this reduced space. We, we built the thing on a, a, an iPhone because that's uh, a, the, what the student had. We intend to, to build it on, the, uh, on an Android phone, which is a bit easier to distribute in terms of um, applications. So the projects we've got starting on the 1st of October is we have an Innovate project with a shadow robot company with a, a gripper, so we're building in-hand cameras as well as on-wrist cameras. And the retina would seem to fit quite nicely for grasping uh, and hand-eye surveying uh, applications. We're working with Lars Mookley at um, the Neuroscience Institute at Glasgow University, investigating two things, how to structure the networks behind the retina in a similar uh, way to how they're organized in the brain. And also looking at how higher order processes feed back into visual area one or our simulated visual area one to do higher order control. What you look at and what you perceive a, a, of what you look at only is considering about 10% of, of the visual information or the, sorry, the information coming in from your eyes constitutes about 10% of the activity in visual area one. So it's interesting to see how we can uh, couple in potentially higher order processes to control with feedback loops the, the overall um, operation of the visual system. So what do we use this for? Well, th this is our, our robot. It's a big Yaskawa uh, Motorman robot, which was used for clothing manipulation. And we have a, you can see up in the top, stereo pair of cameras, and this is the machine uh, calibrating itself. So we have a binocular vision system which we maintain virgins and uh, have uh, gaze control processes on. 
So we would like to apply the retina in this context, and the nice thing is that applying the retina means for every um, process where you would be running the deep net over a little patch and scanning it over the entire image, that can be an entire field of view that's going through the net. So it's massively faster or massively lower power depending on how you apply it. This is the new shadow gripper and we're mounting a camera in there and that's where we intend to drive it using the retina. So in conclusion, we've de demonstrated that the retina DCNN combination will actually learn. So that, that was an unknown. It does reduce the size uh, of input to the, the network. Um, so, so removing the need to do patch scanning. So one gulp, the image goes in and through the net. It reduces the number of training epochs and produces comparable results. I think we can actually get better results using the, the retina. So our challenges and potential to use, um, to be able to process whole images on CNNs using what's there already, using uh, cell phones right now. Um, the challenge is to, to produce a custom layer to use the retina directly. As I say, if anybody has ideas on that, please talk to me. Um, I'm interested in mimicking, as, as Steve Ferber mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, building architectures that ex fully exploit what's known about the brain. For example, the Gabor-like cells in V1, the pinwheel structure there. And um, exploit other uh, biomimetic visual processing techniques. So one idea is to use a neuromorphic camera and we might perhaps, so that each pixel only outputs when something changes. And instead of doing a, a warping transform, because these cameras are usually quite small arrays, we can take a lens that distorts the, that the, 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 uh, applies a foveated view and th onto, down onto the array and then uh, it gives us a very efficient system since the bit of glass is doing some of the computing for us. And finally, the, the, the ongoing thing is how to integrate the system efficiently into hand-eye systems in robotics, for example, because one of the key bottlenecks in robotics is continuous perception, uh, getting away from the old look-think-act uh, paradigm in robotics. So, thank you. <laughs>